Via telephone, Financial Phil McCoy. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Splendid. We're having a little fun here today. Uh, Bill, for those who joined the program late, show everybody your mask again. Is it around? I'm not going to. I will you don't have to put, put it, it on, on, but, yeah, that's, that's just a lovely mask. Phil, that looks like you. <laughs> it doesn't look like Phil. No, least. <laughs> I can't. I can't see it. Oh, you're you're just. It's good. That's a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah hey, Phil. I noticed in the uh, noticed in the paper last week a picture of your daughter playing volleyball. Yeah, she uh, she plays a lot of volleyball, and uh, they just finished up a tournament this weekend, and and I think TV Ten's covering one, if not both, uh, hopefully both. But they start Dylan? sectionals this week. Dylan's on the other side of the glass. Yeah, here they're covering Tuesday. I think you said Tuesday, Musselman versus. Martinsburg, and on the other end of that bracket will be uh, Hedgesville and Spring Mills. And then the winner of those two matches would play Thursday for the section for the section championship. Then those two teams that play on Thursday will then go to the regionals on Saturday. So it's a busy week, busy, Dylan, busy week of volleyball. Dylan, anything to add to what Phil said? We can't oh, here, here we go. As far as I know, that's, uh, that's our schedule for Musselman Martinsburg on Tuesday, and then – uh, the winners of Tuesday's two games uh, on Thursday. Hey, Dylan, while you're here and on mic, and I have Financial Phil, a former Ram, we had uh, Tyson Bagent last night making a primetime debut in the Bears game. They lost to the Chargers, but, uh, Phil, I think you said it this morning. Dylan, get your input here, too. Tyson looked pretty comfortable back there. I, I thought so, and that's kind of how we looked last week. That's just – not a whole lot for him to uh, work with on that offense. Uh, so, I mean, he had some some mistakes of his own. That's mm-hmm. to be expected. But it's not like the the Bears have a whole lot to to deal with uh, Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack uh, back there. But yeah, he did his job. He's at the very least, I think, he solidified himself as someone you can rely on as a backup quarterback, and he can make a nice career out of. Yeah, I kind of I, I walked away with the same impression that he looked like he he belonged, and that he he deserved to be there. And then you know if you look at a few plays, there there was a drop touchdown in the end zone, and the first play of the game, no one ever touched the kid. He could have got up and scored a, a touchdown there as well. So things could have turned differently, but the Chargers got up on him so fast that the running game was basically a moot point. It was too late to start run, running the ball. And it, it kind of put him in a bad situation. But you look at his stat line, he he looked like he belonged. I'd, I mean, I'd say this. I'm a huge Steeler fan, and I'm not giving up on Kenny Pickett. But I'd like to have him in Pittsburgh. He looks better than what our quarterbacks look. Yeah, and also in his defense, the second series, the first series he made that long pass that caught everybody by surprise. But the second series, his offensive line, back-to-back major penalties. So uh, went yes. from good field position to – yeah. Yeah, the center, number 62, yeah. I guess. So. Yeah, if the Bears can't run the ball early, they have problems the rest of the day. That They're not built to do something otherwise. So they couldn't run the ball early because of penalties and whatever. And, and then, you know, yesterday was not a great day for officiating in the NFL, and that, that call that the receiver was down was, you know, stupid. It was a ridiculous call. Yeah. And you mean the first play? Yeah. The first series, yep. So I, and I was watching the Steeler game, obviously, during the day, and, some of the calls in that game were just, and, and I'm, it wasn't just against the Steelers and against the, you know, the Jags too. So, just I don't know. I don't. Sometimes I don't know what referees are watching when they're do, making the calls that they're making. So certainly not what we're watching. I yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty bad. Uh, Phil, uh, let's talk uh, money, and uh, we had some uh, green numbers this morning. Uh, we're still, what, about 45 minutes away from the opening bell. We have a big week coming up, too. What are we up to? Uh, the, the biggest part of this week is the, the Federal Reserve on Wednesday. There's a 90% chance that they will not increase rates, and I think that's pretty much baked in, and we had anticipated that for quite a while. But it's going to be their tone. And that, that's been the case for the majority of the year. It's not, some, it's not been in question what they're going to do, but their tone on – as far as how long they think. And, and, and we have to keep in mind that's subject to change. I, I, I am getting in the camp that we overreact on uh, every single word that the Federal Reserve says because their their opinion or their, their predictions of what they may have to do changes as data comes in, as we get economic d- d- data or data, however we say it, on, on a weekly and monthly basis. 
but that will be the market mover this week. And I, what I think is of utmost importance is Thursday with Apple reporting that Apple, I think, is still the largest company in the world, and the tech market has been battered, something awful, in October, based mainly off of earnings. So Apple may be that, that, that bellwether that could turn that around a little bit for the NASDAQ. Last week we saw the S&P go into a correction and the NASDAQ. Now it's still been, we have to keep this in, in consideration, it's still been a pretty decent year for those two indices, but what a correction is is a 10% fall from its previous high, which was late July for one and early August for the other, so around the same, the same time frame. We've fallen back 10% since then. That's a technical indicator that really in our eyes doesn't mean a whole lot, but sometimes if we get a catalyst or we get some sort of excuse, that could be a buy signal for some. So I think how, how Jerome Powell sounds on Wednesday and Apple's earnings, and there's a ton of companies reporting, but Apple, all the focus uh, will and should go to Apple. And then, of course, the, the weekly reports that we get, we're going to be back focused on economic data. And the JOLT report, now all this stuff that comes out on Wednesday is going to be overshadowed. But the JOLT report that comes out, I think that's also Wednesday, is absolutely going to be overshadowed. And I don't know that that would make its way into the the post-rate um, decision discussion that normally happens at 2.30. I don't know that it will make its way there because it's going to be so fresh. But uh, that, that's been a big one. And on, a, on a monthly basis, we look more and more at that job opening labor turnover to try to tell us the health of our labor market, and is it still an inflationary pressure? Phil, it is not difficult to find a 6% or more CD right now, and a lot of people are choosing that as an option as opposed to looking at the stock market, which may go up one day and then just sell off for like the next three. Uh, and this has become uh, a, a more of a safe haven for people. So I just Googled highest CD rates, and I'm seeing 6.5% uh, in, in places as well. It, when that happens, it's generally speaking not good for the market. What are your thoughts on parking your money in a CD while this turmoil continues to play out worldwide with wars and what have you, and uh, the stock markets are having so much trouble? It, it's certainly more attractive as the rates get high and our markets are volatile, for sure. But you still have to remember that the risk-free rate of return, whether it's in a CD or certificates or any type of cash product. When we say cash, everybody's thinking of greenbacks. But a cash product is something that is risk-free. There is no risk of losing principal. And the whole mindset behind that is that it is not going to keep pace with inflation. And while I admit it is more attractive than it has ever been, the, the uh, cash rates do not keep up with inflation overall and that's the whole premise that's a premise behind our banking system so if you need that money in the short term and this is the same advice we'd give if cd rates were a quarter of a percent like they were not that long ago if you need that money in the short term regardless of what the uh, risk-free rate of return is then that's where it should be but if it's long-term money even with all this volatility if it's long-term money uh, it, the history shows because that is timing the market. That's what that's doing. So if you say, "Hey, look, I can get five and a half or six percent," and let's just, as an example, say a one-year CD. The problem is, and look at from January till August. Now I'm aware of what's happened since August, but looking from January until August in equity markets, you could have been in a four or five percent CD then as well but you would have missed out on a 20 to 25%, depending on how it's invested, a 20 to 25% return on the equity side of your portfolio in that. Now, this is also worth mentioning because we're getting to a period where these bonds, you know, when we look at our portfolio, we put all the focus on equities because they're more volatile and they attract all the attention and bonds are kind of boring and there's a more technical analysis to, to tell us how they performed. Bonds have struggled something awful since 2022, and it's a, it's a bond market like we haven't seen in a while. The good news on the bond side, and I'm not suggesting that someone change their asset allocation. Your asset allocation is specific to you, not to the markets, but I'm, and I'm, so I'm not suggesting that. But we are going to run into a period where bonds will be heavily favored. 
when rates do start to come back down. Most think right now they've pushed it out to the 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 most popular opinion I've heard anyway has been the next rate movement will be down. It won't be up. It will be down. So and now we're just trying to determine how far out that will be. One of the asset classes that's going to benefit the most from that are bonds. And it, it's hard to describe without having my trusty whiteboard beside me, but when rates go down, current bond values go up and vice versa, which is why we've seen bonds struggle. So that's something to consider because something we hear a lot is like, hey, shouldn't I have my bond exposure in in cash or in a cash position? And I can look at recent history and say, well, yeah, I understand why you come up with that. And you wouldn't get a huge argument from me, especially if you're going to need it. So you wouldn't get a huge argument from me. But we are approaching a time where bond performance will far outweigh what cash performance is. And I don't know how far away that is, but even if I did, I wouldn't suggest it because we don't try to time the markets. But I can, I do see the attractiveness of that. We've become accustomed to really, really low uh, cash rates or risk-free rate of return in dealing with all this volatility and uncertainty. And like you had just said, uh, political issues and overseas and wars and I get it. I understand it. But the the biggest risk that we face is the timing risk and not being there for recovery. We, and even with one or two of our clients, we saw that earlier this year. They just couldn't take the volatility anymore. And then they backed away or, or they, they, they instructed us, pull some of that money out. And then from January to August, man, we were on fire. And still for the year, for the year, I know I'm looking at a bigger picture, but for the year, even since October of last year, it's still been a pretty good run, even though we're in a correction right now. A correction is part of a bull market, and it is part of a healthy market. It just depends on how far it goes, which is why I'm hoping that some of this data data that we get this week kind of is a catalyst to pull us out of this correction. Yeah, Phil, I, the more I listen, the more confused I become. What would normally be good news is actually yes. bad news. The economy growing should be good news, but yet for yes. the market it was bad news. Uh, the job market should be good news, but yet it's bad news. Uh, the uh, uh, the interest rates were getting down in the area that we've been very happy with a couple three years or so ago. It's bad news because we're not to that magic two percent or two point five, whatever the case may be. Uh, I've been following the market a long time, but I have never seen, or at least I cannot remember, the magnitudes of these. These beta swings is what we're saying right now. And I, I'm having trouble finding what's generating. Seems to be a lot more anticipation other than performance. Uh, and it's anticipation is across the board, whereas performance appears to be more secondary than what it has been in times past. How far off base am I, Phil? No, you're, you're, you've nailed it, exactly. And when we're in periods of in, in inflationary periods where we're battling inflation, this is why the good news is bad news, because all those good news things that you had just brought up, GDP numbers and a healthy job market and people spending money, those are all good economic indicators, and they're all telling us we have a strong, humming economy. The problem is, is they are all inflationary pressures, every single one of those force inflation up while the Federal Reserve is trying to get inflation down. So when the and, and it goes back to something Rob had just said a moment ago. So when the Federal Reserve is increasing rates or keeping rates higher for longer, which I think is the environment we're in now, keeping rates higher for longer, it makes it difficult for equity equities and bonds to make money on the secondary market. One reason is because of it, just like Rob said, if you're an investor, an individual investor, not here, but if an individual investor that were to say, hey, I'm tired of this, I'm just going to get my 5 or 6% risk-free rate of return and deal with it, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort, sort all this stuff out later, well, you have money leaving equities. And then the intrinsic value, you know, we used to talk about this a lot last year, but the intrinsic value of stocks, one of the one of the equations to get the the cap m equation to find the intrinsic value is interest rates and the higher the risk free rate of return is the lower the value of the stock so those that do fundamental analysis especially with mutual funds and such uh, they're seeing stocks are lower in value than what the market is trading it for 
so therefore they sell off. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And also to keep in mind that the stock market and the economy does not run in lockstep. The, econ the economic data that we get is looking back. The markets try to move forward. They try to, pre they try to predict, like you had just said, they're trying to predict what is next. We've already seen what has happened. What's going to happen next? Now, they're predicting that based off of the information we got had gotten from before, but it's all a prediction in the stock market or an assumption that we're going to move one way or the other based off of right now, based off of interest rates and what is Jerome Powell going to do. But everything that happens, and I can't stress this enough, and I don't know that everybody buys into this as, as strongly as I do, Every single thing that happens in our American markets right now, and probably a lot across the world as well, is funneling down into what does that do to an inflation, and what does the Federal Reserve or those policymakers, how do they view that, and how do they read that, and what are they likely to do? And it doesn't matter what it is. It all funnels down to that, which is why Wednesday is so very important to see what comes out of his mouth. And my guess is he's not going to say anything drastic one way or the other. And, and it's not a guess. It's almost a certainty at this point. They're not going to increase rates at this meeting, but it's going to be the tone moving forward. Is there going to be a warning that there could be more or we're willing or looking at keeping rates higher for longer, maybe even all the way through 2024? That would be bad news. But if he were to insinuate, if we get some data that encourages us that inflation is going to start to trend back down, Think of a Grinch rally instead of a Santa Claus rally. When we talk about around Christmas, we talk about Santa Claus rallies almost every year where the consumer is really strong and they go out and spend a bunch of money, and that, and that pushes us the first quarter of the following year. This year I think we, we may want a Grinch rally where everybody hangs on to their purses a little bit and, and they don't spend as much as what they had in the past. The Federal Reserve would view that as a weakening consumer, and there will be no better indication of the strength of the consumer and our willing willingness to spend than over the holiday seasons. Hey, Phil, let me give you a hypothetical here, <clears throat> going back to Rob's discussion of the 6.5% CD rates and what have you. If you have a 40-year-old client, uh, they've got a family, let's say they've got a balance of, call it $150,000 in their account, and they end up with another ten, a windfall of $10,000. Are you putting that in the market for them? Are you going to put that? Are you going to recommend the CD? It's one thing to rebalance a portfolio. That's market timing. It's another to put new money into the market. What would you do? I would put that in based off of their asset allocation and their upcoming needs. So if they ran into $10,000 and they were to say, hey, Phil, by the way, in March, we're going to get some repairs to our home or we need a down payment on a car, that 10000 would go into a CD. But if there's no expenses in the in the near future, if they're if they've got their emergency fund at least six months of expenses saved up along on the sidelines, if they've already got that, then it goes into the asset allocation that's appropriate for them. So a 40 year old, and this is just a very generalized statement, without knowing all the details of their income and expenses and their children and their and their and their opportunities and pitfalls and all that fun stuff. But if they had a, a mix of a 80-20, 80% equities and 20% fixed income slash bonds, then it would get that, that 10000 would be split amongst that exactly like that, 8000 in equities and 20% on the bond side. And honestly, since we're in a correction based off of last week, I'd be pretty excited about that 80% that's going in there because I know it's 10% cheaper than what it was back in early, at least 10% cheaper than what it was back in, in August. So that those blinders would be on whether we're up 30% or down 30%. Those blinders would be on based off what that 40-year-old with a very long time frame, what their goals are and all those, all those factors that surround them. And a week later when there's a correction, what's the likelihood of that investor calling you? <laughs> Well, if they understand, zero, if they understand how this stuff works. But we are in a correction right now. So, what? But you, know, you look at the flip side. If we go up 10% in the next month, are they going to be calling me, telling me thank you? Probably not. They, they won't look at it that much. But our our clients, without, without exception, we look at that client, what that client is trying to accomplish. We do not t try to time the markets. If you just look at – all the experts that's out and they're trying to time the market, well, half of them's wrong. And we're not going to be wrong on the side of timing. If you time wrong, it's deadly and you can't fix it. If you stay focused and you stay to your asset allocation and you stay the course regardless 
of what's going on at this moment in the market. We're not investing for a month or a week or two months or six months or a year. We're investing for people's lifetime, and that's what we do here. Now, you may have stockbrokers that do day trading and so forth, and that's really not our cup of tea. Now, we have our, our, our picks and our selections and so forth, of course, but timing the market isn't our cup of tea. And trying to predict what's going to happen next, not going to catch us doing it because half of the time you're wrong. It's a gamble, and we don't like to gamble. If you put $100 into the S&P 500 index as a fund in 2013, today that would be worth $363.73. That is a 13.09% annual return. And if you factor in inflation, it still works out to 10.12% per year in real dollars, which is Phil's point as to why a 6.5% CD, no matter how long, will not keep up with the market. And then there's, yeah. then there's a doomsday scenario of gold. How much do you are you seeing people invest in gold now? Because gold does not bring you anything except no. doomsday. Exactly. We've had a few questions about it. And in a nutshell, it does make its way into portfolios, into a diversified portfolio. But the, the, the fact is when you look at gold, it has a standard deviation and risk factor, factors that look kind of like equity, and it gives you bond returns. If we're going to say, look, if we're going to take equity exposure, we want equity return. So gold in heavy amounts in our portfolios, we don't really want it, and people want it for not in heavy amounts anyway. The people that actually ask for it are looking for uh, something that's contrarian to the markets. And even though we're in a correction right now, Markets still go up 78% of the time. I don't want to bet on the 22%. I'm not going to lay money on that 22% and try to time it and as one-fifth that it's going to, to go the opposite direction of the markets. So it is in our portfolios, uh, but very, very, very small amounts. Financial Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and say us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, guys. Catch Phil each weekday morning at 638 for a two-minute synopsis on the day's market.